Okay, hi everyone. Uh, today we are talking about uh, viscose and man-made cellulose with Shamuel Hock. Shamuel is a sustain, uh, sustainable material and traceability expert, and he also functions as a senior advisor for AMRA, actually. So we are very happy and proud to have Shamuel with us here today. Hello, Shamuel. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, so I have been working in the uh, textile industry for about 14 years now, and I have been very fortunate to be working with some of the industry leaders when it comes to the whole business. I, my exposure to the world of sustainable materials in textiles uh, started actually with traceability. Uh, so I worked with one of those companies who are considered as pioneers of the concept of traceability within textile supply chain in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where my passion has sparked uh, towards uh, sustainable materials and traceability as a concept itself. I have also worked with some of the world's largest uh, fashion brands whose main focus has been uh, using of sustainable materials in the core of their business, who are very conscious about its uh, influence, its uh, footprint on the environment of well-being of the people um, that uh, we operate in, in the, of the atmosphere that we operate in. Uh, so yes, basically I think uh, my exposure to the world of sustainable materials and traceability comes from the companies that I have been very fortunate to be working for. I have also worked with another fantastic company which specializes mainly in the circularity area of textile apparels uh, coming from uh, both post and pre-consumer waste. Uh, okay, so start then uh, a little bit about talking about this uh, man-made cellulosic. But uh, if we on a positive note, what is it that is um, what is that is so positive about this material, and why has it become uh, such a popular fiber in the world? Okay, uh, so as we decided, we will refer to viscose as viscose and not as an MMC fiber. But yeah. I'll just give a very quick background about the MMC, right? So. MMC is a man-made cellulosic. That's how it's being referred to. So viscose is actually a man-made cellulosic fiber, which is neither natural nor synthetic, right? So we know natural fibers are the ones like cotton, right? Or linen, which is actually grown. Uh, and then it is converted uh, you know, uh, in, into fibers. Then we have synthetics, which is mainly uh, petroleum-based, which chemically, uh, processed into being uh, being a fiber. So viscose sits right in the middle of it. It is derived from plant-based materials. So it's not grown in the form of a fiber crop like cotton is, but it is a plant-based material which is processed chemically to convert it into a fiber. So that's what uh, viscose fiber is. And viscose was developed in... 1883, if I'm not wrong, or somewhere around that time. Mm -hmm. And the reason the demand for viscose came was uh, because at that point of time in history, silk was a very highly uh, regarded by very costly material that had been used by royalty. And because of the uh, very high processing cost and low availability of silk, scientists have been looking for a material that could serve as an alternative to silk. And that's how rayon or viscose was invented. So mm -hmm. uh, rayon and viscose are kind of the same thing. There are slightly slight differences. I will not go into that much detail, but uh, that's approximately when viscose was invented. And the reason why it became very popular very quickly, because it's it's actually a very fantastic fabric to work with. I'm sure uh, fashion designers uh, who probably are also listening to this uh, will agree with me. It's an in inexpensive material, but it is very, uh, so listing out the positive qualities of this course, it's, it, it's breathable, it's a breathable uh, fiber. It drips really well. So fabric or product made out of this fiber, this fiber is drips really well. It has an excellent color retention, highly absorbent, 
of uh, diastrophenic chemicals and the look because it has a silk kind look it's it sits somewhere between cotton and silk so mm. it 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 has a very big market appeal it looks really good it uh, does not it does not trap the body heat so which means this is a very uh, very useful uh, fiber uh, to use in your products for summer collections it's the extremely popular material for women's wear uh, at the same time they are also are uh, uh, this material blends really well with other materials so you have probably noticed if you if you look if you are one of the people who look into the care label or composition in the products you would see that viscose is present in uh, outdoor clothing like outdoor formal wear or lounge wear it is present in jersey it is present in uh, ladies wear tops <clears throat> and dresses so it's it's a very 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 popular fabric and it can blend really nicely with other fibers and there can be a multitude of applications that can come from using this fiber it sounds just from uh, listening to you i mean it sounds all, almost like the perfect material uh, also i suppose it's um, and like the cost of it is is so much lower as well than if yes. you would compare to to silk or uh, other similar materials so then uh, what would you then say that what are the negative sides of it um, if we go into that a little bit Mm-hmm. where this course actually has a little bit of downside is how in the process how it is manufactured right so yeah. we know that it's coming from plant based materials which means that it can be linked with deforestation it can be linked with illegal logging and other uh, you know other other ways of unsustainable forest management activities uh, in the manufacturing process it's also uh, it, it's one of the most heavily polluting processes because it uses a lot of chemicals and mainly the chemicals that are used are quite harmful and very toxic so which also has a very negative side to it um if the water or if the waste released from the process is not treated properly it can cause severe damage to the environment it can cause uh, probably some prolonged exposure to this material or this waste can cause severe damages to the health of uh, of the biological life in and around the factory and it also is a very high uh electricity consuming uh process so the viscous manufacturing process consumes a lot of electricity which uh increases its uh its footprint on the environment so to summarize it uh i can th- i i can say that there are three major challenges that you're highlighting now the first one being the illegal um, uh deforestation that might be that might occur with it and uh, the second one is the heavy chemical use that uh, that is used in the processing and the third one is then the the, the very intensive el- 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 electricity use that is used while uh, processing it as, as well the, how how can you kind of tackle these these challenges if you still want to buy viscos um as a brand Uh, so it's very important for a brand to do a proper due diligence and to understand uh, where the viscose is coming from right mm. uh, there are several uh, certification systems available in the market that can uh, give you certain level of guarantee that your uh, the raw material is coming from a properly managed sustainable forest program Uh, mm-hmm. the processes that has been used actually is a closed loop system or the effluent is treated properly so uh, there there are unfortunately not a one holistic certification system that can cover the whole range of uh, you know negativity that can come out of it but unlike other materials viscose actually has the potential of becoming the most sustainable fiber in its in itself at like uh, in itself uh, anyway because okay. ensuring that the material is coming from an uh, a certified forestry mm-hmm. ensuring that it's using a closed loop manufacturing system 
-hmm. and ensuring that you are using green energy to produce the material just by complying with these three factors mm -hmm. viscose can actually become more sustainable than any other form of material okay so then tell me a little about about uh, tell me a bit about these commercial alternatives that are out there as well like uh, like Tencel, for example, uh, or I mean, there are some of these commercial alternatives that are popping up, uh, which are not really regarded as a certification as such, but they are still a better alternative to the conventional uh, viscose. Uh, tell me about those. What is the difference between a certified material and buying a, a, conver a co commercially better alternative? Okay, so I'll just very quickly take you through. There is, there are basically three versions of alternatives to regular uh, conventional viscose that exists in mm -hmm. the market. One that, that I've already touched upon a little bit is model. So model is basically bamboo-based viscose. Bamboo, as we know, it's it grows as weed, right? There is no need to take care of it. It grows in abundance. So using bamboo. Uh, to use the manufacturing of viscose uh, in the process is actually called model. So model in itself is different because the input material is a little bit different, but in terms mm -hmm. of how the process is, it is unfortunately not that much sustainable than conventional viscose. So okay. the processing part of it, of getting from wood chips or the pulp to the fiber, it's mm -hmm. equally polluting as viscose, but where viscose has the option to be sourced from or you know, from illegal forestry, uh, visco uh, model is always coming from bamboo, which we know is a much more sustainable source uh, for the fiber. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we can talk about lyocell, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. tencel. Tencel is actually a lensing version of the material called lyocell. Lyocell is uh, regarded as a more sustainable fiber, uh, more sustainable um, alternative to viscose, because mm -hmm. first of all, it mainly uses sustainable forestry. It uses eucalyptus trees. At the same time, it uses NMNO, a specific chemical, which is a closed loop process. So the recovery rate of using NMNO is almost above 99%. So mm -hmm. the harmful chemical which used in viscose production mm -hmm. cannot be recovered. You can maximum maybe recover up to 25% of it. The rest of it actually becomes waste. Whereas in the tensile or lyocell manufacturing process, you can recover over 99% of the input chemical. But right now, another great thing is happening, which is there are quite a few new technologies coming up who are actually making recycled viscose. So mm. recycled viscose is chemically uh, recycling of cellulose-based fiber into viscose-like material. It's not 100% viscose or like lyocell or model, but it is very close to that. And usually it can use both all types of cellulosic material as an input. So uh, even so if you have a, a, a ready-made garment, made of cotton, for example, it can go into that process and, and become recycled viscose. Yes, yes, definitely it can. It, uh, there are uh, technologies, like I can name a few brands like Renewcell or Sodra who are really making big strides in the industry with their mm -hmm. recycling program. At the same time, we also have the traditional players like Lensing or Birla who are also coming up with their own version of you know, of recycled, uh, recycled viscose. You might have heard of the name Yukovero. You might have the, heard the name Liva Eco, right? These are all basically uh, recycled, sustainable versions of the traditional, uh, traditional conventional viscose. One thing that I'm missing and one that I'm sitting here thinking about is the Canopy Hot Button Report. Where, where does that fit in? So Canopy... Uh, they are, um, so it's an, it's an organization who uh, gives their own take on the, how sustainable each of these discourse manufacturing companies are. They're mm -hmm. a highly regarded and like, accepted standard or um, an organization whose views are widely accepted as uh, watchdogs who look into 
uh, how sustainable a viscose manufacturing company is. So they have this ranking system of uh, the what they call hot button reports. So it can be from red to red, green to red, right? Yeah. Green, yellow, orange, red. That's how they identify and they rate the effective viscose manufacturing industries as they are being sustainable or not. In general, they mainly look at the source of the raw material. So making sure that the, it, it, had, it, can, it is not linked with any illegal practices when sourcing the main wood, wood chips or plant uh, coming out of the forests. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the main criteria. But recently they have also been talking to ZDHC by the way, uh, ZDHC or Zero Discharge Hazardous Chemicals Initiative, they recently came up in April this year. Uh, they came up with their own guidelines on uh, for viscose manufacturers to follow uh, when okay. it comes to the processing of viscose uh, materials, or actually creating of the viscose fiber. Uh, so Canopy uh, Hot Button Report is also something brands rely quite a lot. So there are many brands who have made a public level uh, declaration that we would only source our discourse from a canopy certified factory which has green button rating. But so what is then the difference between the canopy and the uh, FSC certification? Uh, because they all both kind of look at the, the more sustainably, um, uh, the more sustainable forest aspect, right? Yes. The difference is um, FSC certified material can actually serve as a, uh, as a basis for a, a claim on your finished product. So mm -hmm. if you have uh, all of your supply chain members, starting from the viscous manufacturer all the way to your finished product manufacturer, mm -hmm. all certified under uh, viscous uh, chain of custody certification program, Mm -hmm. then you can actually follow through a uh, document level traceability of the material and you can actually have a FSC level certification on your product. Mm -hmm. So you can use FSC logo while marketing your product, okay. kind of saying it, it is more sustainable. It is a marketable yeah. product. Whereas when uh, Canopy, it does not have, uh, it does not cover all your supply chain, Canopy rating, mm -hmm. Canopy ranking, covers only the viscose manufacturer. I understand. I understand. Very interesting because then we kind of get into um, the more the transparency piece of, of this conversation as well that I really want to dig into and understand more about um, because I think this is very important even though you have a, a traceability scheme in place and maybe though you have uh, you can certify that your product comes from a certain material and so forth, you don't necessarily have the transparency and the visibility into that uh, supply chain. Um, how, what would you say is the, the, the biggest challenge for many brands in order to, to achieve this type of uh, transparency uh, when it comes to supply chain and especially the man-made cellulosics and the visco supply chain? I think traceability in itself is a very big challenge irrespective of what type of material it is. Uh, the key to having a full traceability of your product, making sure and understanding that it is coming from the right sources is actually to have the, you know, the full visibility of your supply chain. And when I say supply chain, I mean the extended supply chain. That means who your product manufacturers are. Uh, fabric manufacturers, yarn manufacturers, fiber manufacturers, what is the source of that fiber to having an holistic overview of, uh, of your supply chain that becomes a very key to understanding, uh, you know, how sustainable or how traceable you can become. So the biggest challenge is to get that visibility and to have all of them all these organizations look in with your sustainability vision, with your sustainability idea, making them share the same goals and visions and asking them to, you know, to confirm to this requirements that you have set in place for traceability purpose or for tracking that sustainable raw materials has been used. But at the end, I think the biggest challenge comes to the communication part of it, right? So for a brand to be able to 
understand and specify for themselves which standards they would want to be using in their supply chain and communicating that effectively to the extended supply chain members making sure everybody understands and shares the same vision yeah i understand yeah and you're really now you're taking it one step further even that you know making sure that everyone within the supply chain is actually you know following your standards and so on and i, I think that's definitely the ambition that we should all have but i i also think that many brands today they they uh, they struggle with just getting that visibility uh, and understanding which are the which are the players within w- within the supply chain and but what you're saying that certain materials or certain fibers that uh, which are more the more commercial ones they will have their own traceability systems so if you buy those you would automatically get that uh, transparency yeah. Yeah, so that's one option. Uh, I think that's very good to highlight. Um, and, and another option. Uh, oh, oh, so what would you say for for brands that that, that are not buying these type of uh, materials? Maybe they are buying more conventional materials, but they anyway want to have that visibility into the supply chain. What can they do? Uh, so if you are not, um, it's it's about doing the due diligence and try to find out and understand. Who, who is the supplier of the viscose fiber? You don't have to buy the branded ones, but you can pick and choose and select those uh, manufacturers who are regarded as more sustainable than the others in the industry and try and ensure within your supply chain that you are, uh, your suppliers are sourcing their fiber from those organizations only. That's the that's one way. That's the easiest way to somehow uh, safeguard yourself from you know from any uh, unsustainable activities when it comes to sourcing of viscose materials. Based on where you at, I think the minimum uh, that you can do is just nominating some sources of fibers or some mm-hmm. organizations, some brands. Mm-hmm. Good. That's a very. I think that's a very good uh, tip and recommendation. Um, then, if we move on a little bit, um, I want to also touch. Uh, before I come to my last question, I want to touch a little bit about the circularity of viscose and the ability to to recycle uh, uh, viscose. What is what? What should a brand think about when they design and they? when they design a product that is made of uh, viscose in order to make it recyclable. Okay. Uh, So as in any other materials, I think a very key component of designing a product made for circularity or made for recycling, easily recyclable, is using the monomaterial concept, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are using a viscose in your product, try and make sure that it is 100% viscose only. If not, then try and make sure that it contains only uh, uh, natural fibers. It's a mix mix of uh, natural fibers only. So you blend it with cotton, you blend it with linen, you blend it with any other fibers, any other non-synthetic fibers that can easily be recycled. Uh, Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you are using uh, re- like synthetic fibers in the mix, like viscose elastin is a very common, uh, for a very common composition for viscose jersey in the market, which is a very good quality material, very you know very appealing product, very appealing fabric to be used in your products. But try to limit the composition of the synthetic fiber as much as possible. So similarly, you can probably get. A uh, more or less similar kind of effect by using five to ten percent of elastin in the fabric. Of course, five to ten percent is quite a big difference. There could be some significant difference in the appearance of the fabric. But as long as you can limit the exposure to synthetic or the blend with synthetic to minimum, the more highly recyclable it becomes. Okay. So, so the less, yeah. even if there is a small percentage of elastin, for example, then it still will be recyclable. As I said, uh, like the likes of Frenucil and Sodra, and there are quite a few, I don't remember the names at the top of my head, who are coming up with very innovative recycling technologies. Mm-hmm. And they are able to process materials with blends up to 
five percent, up to ten percent, up to fifteen percent. Depends on okay. technology. Technology differs, uh, and unfortunately, they are not very large scalable at as of yet. But yes, there are technologies coming up. So keep an eye on the innovations that's going on in that you know recycling space in the industry, and try to make sure that you are creating products with those fiber compositions which are easily recyclable. Yeah. I think that's a good point. So the designing of the material is very uh, important when you decide on the blend and so forth. But then I suppose the designing of the product could also make a difference when it comes to the threads, the buttons, uh, and so forth. Uh, is there anything to be said about that? Well, the most commonly used uh, pro the material in making a product is the swing thread, right? So mm -hmm. even if it does not have any buttons or any other accessories added to it, you at least need the sewing thread to shape the fabric into the product that you want to wear, right? So yeah. uh, there are, uh, though not, again, not available at scale, but there are certain alternatives to traditional polyester-based sewing threads out there in the market already. Like mm -hmm. very commonly, there is this, Tencel, um, the lensing, uh, lensing certified sewing thread, if I'm not wrong, uh, mm -hmm. which is made of similar plant-based materials. Like it's mm -hmm. same thing, viscose fiber is made of. They are making swing threads out of it, which uh, very recently uh, one of the um, very well-known fashion brands in the world is actually making a denim collection using the tensile swing threads in their product which they are marketing as something that can be easily recycled, right? So mm -hmm. again, at the end of the day, we are using a uh, cellulose-based uh, swing thread. So that means, you know, uh, it, it can be easily recycled. So when we look at the product, we look at the product design, uh, there will be attachments, there will be accessories uh, like buttons or zippers, which are used. So as long as they are made from sustainable materials in a way that they can be easily taken apart because recycling post-consumer product is a very big challenge, right? Because yeah. there are sort of so many things that you need to do. You need to take things apart uh, before you can actually put that into recycling. So all the metallic parts, all the plastic, all the uh, wood-based like buttons or whatever it can be, like, you have to separate, segregate them all before you can take the fabric and put it in for recycling. So if you are make using, uh, you know, more easy to take apart products like met parts to design your product, then I think that's a winner. That's a very good way of doing it. Yes. Thank you so much for that. That's great. Um, then finally, I just want to, um, I want to hear your thoughts about the future. And uh, if we look 10 years from now, what does the future of viscose look like? And like, how are we consuming viscose and man-made cellulosics, do you think? Oh, that's, um, that's a very interesting question because not, you know, not many people know the challenges that this industry is facing right now, which is good because these challenges are actually forcing all these viscose manufacturing companies look into more sustainable methods of production and also sustainable material as feedstock because with the current rate of consumption and growing demand for FSC certified materials, it, a research showed that within the year 2027 to 28, so that's seven to eight years from now, we will run out of FSC certified forests to use to manufacture our viscose products. So which means either we start cutting down all the for endangered forests that we have, which is not the way to go. So that means we are, when which we see happening, these organizations are heavily focusing and investing on research and development of more sustainable viscose on recycling of viscose materials. So mm. I, for one thing, that the future looks really good. We may not have, uh, we, may, may, we may need to limit ourselves a little bit with the amount of clothing we can have made of this material. But I can, I have that confidence that whatever we have in our closet, it will make us feel good because it's all going to be sustainably made and sustainably sourced 
uh, viscose materials. So thank you so much, Samuel, for, for, for that. Uh, let's finish off with that very positive note uh, about the future of viscose. I think that sounds, sounds very, very good. Um, I'm very happy that you, that you were here with me today and that you uh, talked to me about the viscose supply chain and all of the challenges and opportunities. So thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you and to get to share my knowledge and experience about this material with you.